Number 10, the Busby Stoop Chair. Yeah, we're kicking this haunted list off with a chair. It's pretty spooky, let's do it. The Busby Stoop Chair comes from 1702, 10 years after the Salem Witch Trial, so take this one with a grain of salt, you know what I mean? People made odd choices back then. Women were witches and chairs were evil. Welcome to 1702, folks. Englishman Thomas Bubsy had some issues with his father-in-law and he didn't handle them too well, so now he has to be, you know, hanged for it. Yeah, you can't just kill people for no reason, Thomas. What is this, 1692? He was hanged near the Humble Inn, ironic, but a chair that was nearby is now said to hold the spirit of one Thomas Busby. If you sit on this chair, you are set to die in a frightful accident. So the chair was declared haunted, but did anything actually happen? Honestly, yeah, kind of. Locals say that during World War II, airmen from a nearby base came to the pub, the inn rather, and those who sat on it never returned. In the 70s, more accidents were connected, but they still kept the chair around until 1978. It stayed in the inn for that long until it was donated to the Thirsk Museum. Honestly, it's not even a rock chair. It looks like it should be a rocking chair, but it's not a rocking chair. That's the scariest part if you ask me. Number nine. The hands resist him. I listed off some dark paintings not too long ago, but somehow I forgot the hands resisting him. Painter Bill Stoneham created this work of art back in 1972. It's most famously belonged to actor John Marley from The Godfather. He's the guy who wakes up with the horse's head in his bed, in case you have seen that movie. So that actor got this painting at one point, but later it was found on eBay with claims that it was cursed from an anonymous previous seller. And the painting was found abandoned in an alley behind a brewery. So that sounds pretty promising. Almost immediately, the new owner of the painting, the family, their daughter claimed to have seen people in the painting move. Yeah, on top of that, apparently the figures would leave the painting and mess up the house. I mean, as far as excuses go, that's not bad for a messy house. Oh, I cleaned up earlier, but those damn paintings. Oh. Number eight, cursed phone number. The song 8675309 has been stuck in my head for about 18 years now. That song is a banger. Honestly, great jingle too. If a pizza place had thought of that jingle at first, would have been game over if you ask me. A cursed phone number. Is there such a thing? Apparently, yes. 359-888 and then a bunch of eights afterwards. I don't want to say it out loud you know? So what's the deal here? Well, anybody who's had this phone number in the last 20 years or so has met their fate almost immediately after. CEO of a Bulgarian phone company, Cancer, at 48, that's how he passed away. Two criminals later on, both a little more mysterious than Cancer, they both passed away afterwards. All these deaths happened within four years. That's the cursed aspect of it all. The phone number was suspended, so nobody's able to use it now. In case you're thinking about it, don't do it. Maybe it's because of this curse, or maybe it has ties to crime. Either way, 8675309 is still stuck in my head. I'm gonna go down with that song right as soon as we're done here. Number seven, the Bassano vase. This vase comes from the 15th century. It made for an excellent wedding gift in Italy, but the night before the big day, the bride sadly lost her life with the vase still in her hands. The family kept it afterwards, of course, but as the vase was passed down the family line, a pattern began to unveil itself. Whomever held possession of the Bassano vase died shortly afterwards. Now, keep in mind, this was the 15th century, so the average lifespan around then was like, I don't know, 30 years old. But after that many deaths in the family, it was packed away for good, just to be safe, or so they thought. The vase showed up again in 1988 alongside a note. The note was pretty to the point. It said, beware this vase, it brings death. Whoever found it was probably like, okay. They continued on with the vase and later it was auctioned for over $2,000, sans note, of course. You don't wanna throw that in there. The pharmacist who won the auction, you guessed it, passed away within months. Number six, Baker's wedding dress. Why is it in so many horror movies that the ghost is always a lady in a white dress? Why are there so many ghosts in nightgowns? What's going on? Why are you all so sleepy? Maybe they're taken out before their wedding night over a vase, or maybe it's this one. Back in 1849 in the small town of Altoona, Pennsylvania, Elias Baker and his wife Hetty lived in the Baker mansion. They had two sons and one daughter named Anna. Anna had fallen in love with one of her father's employees, another steel worker, but after her father wouldn't allow the relationship to take off, <sighs> classic, Anna vowed to never marry anybody, and she locked herself away in her room. Now, when her father passed away in 1848, she went to go find her true love again, but he had since settled down with somebody else. So she spent the rest of her days behind behaving erratically and her soul still haunts that same wedding dress today. The wedding dress she never ended up using. Not just the dress, the mansion is haunted as well. Guests would report furniture moving around by itself. Honestly, it's not a bad haunting if you ask me. Moving couches? That would be a great help. I have a terrible back. I would love that. Number five. The Crying Boy Painting. Just the name alone. Okay, I want nothing to do with this one. Yeah, we're back with another haunted painting. What is this, Hogwarts? Why are so many paintings moving around at night? This English curse kicked off in the 50s. Now, this is a reproduction of Bruno Amadio's The Crying Boy Painting, but this painting is apparently responsible for lots of fires. In September 1985, a family's home burnt down, everything was gone, but the painting looked untouched. British tabloid The Sun even published a story on it, which I'm sure helped the situation. It read, Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy Picture. 
Now we laugh at beliefs from the Middle Ages and all that, but we're not really much further here, are we? People smoking in every house in the 50s were like, yeah, maybe it was a painting. It was probably that. Number four, the Hope Diamond. Coming from the 1660s, this curse began when a gem dealer named Jean-Baptiste Tavernier bought this large diamond when visiting India. He bought it, apparently, okay. The origins of the diamond were unknown, but it didn't matter. This beauty was just sitting there and he had to. Well, later on, after Tavernier got the uh, diamond, rumors spread throughout Europe and the United States that Tavernier actually stole the diamond from the statue of a Hindu goddess. The newspapers actually kicked this one off by publishing the Hope Diamond as an ancient curse. The diamond at one point ended up in the hands of King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Now, if you don't know about them in history, they were, they lost their lives during the French Revolution. We'll say that. The old guillotine dream team. The stone then went to Lord Francis Hope come 1839, and by that point, it was deemed cursed officially. This is when it got the name, the Hope Diamond, right? They ended up selling the diamond shortly after being reduced to poverty. Then Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the stone in 1912. Shortly after, her son was killed in a car accident. So just bad news all around. When the stone was delivered to its final and current home, the Smithsonian, back in 1958, the driver delivering the package was later hit by a truck. He survived, but shortly after, his house caught fire. Moral of the story, you don't need diamonds for more reasons than one. Number three, the Anguished Man. Historical paintings are cool, but this is the first time I've read up on the Anguished Man myself. Gotta admit, it's pretty unsettling. Wow. It's considered one of the most haunted objects in the world, and it looks like it too. Definitely would, I would guess, I'd pick it out of the crowd. This oil painting was created by an unknown artist, but the actual paint is mixed with their blood. So their legit DNA is in this painting. Blood, sweat, and tears, literally. Not much is known of the artist as he passed away shortly after, but the current owner is Sean Robinson from Cumbria, England. His grandmother had given him the painting. There wasn't much known beforehand, but his grandmother warned him that it was cursed. Hey, here's some Werther's originals and a cursed painting. Classic grandmas, you know how they do. Sean had to leave it in his basement at first because his wife wasn't a fan, more than fair. But when the basement flooded, which is also mysterious and that sucks, he had to then move it upstairs. After that point, the couple heard crying, screams, whispering all throughout the house, things you don't want to hear alone in a house with a haunted painting. It got so bad, Robinson uploaded time-lapse footage to YouTube in 2011, and it shows the door closing by itself next to the painting. Check it out. Also, yeah, keep this in the basement for sure. I agree with the missus on this one. Number two, broken mirrors. It doesn't matter who you are, you've heard of this one at some point. You break a mirror and what do you get? Bad luck. You get seven years of bad luck. Has this happened to you? If so, what year are you on? Are you close? How close are you to the seven year mark? We got your back, you got this, you're so close. Ancient Romans kicked this one off. They believed that the human soul would renew every seven years. That's where the whole seven year thing comes into play. It takes time to repair the human soul, apparently. That combined with the belief that a mirror's reflection was a way into the soul, well, now we have one guy who feels really bad for breaking a mirror, essentially. Therefore, a curse. If you break a mirror, you're tearing the soul from the body and abandoning it. In Kazakhstan, if you break a mirror, evil spirits would haunt the person responsible for the damage. That's a pretty scary deal. You gotta keep those hands grippy. They say you can't look into broken mirror pieces afterwards or else that's bad luck in itself. There's too many mirrors now, honestly, cut to today. I'm sure ancient Romans had no idea what 2022 would look like. We have phone cases with mirrors in them now. That's a lot of bad luck in jean pockets, my friends. And coming in number one, curse of the billy goat. Can a team be cursed? Is that such a thing? Here we go. I mean, I live in Toronto, home of the Maple Leafs, and we don't, we don't see a lot of wins on that side, but the Chicago Cubs curse, well, that was a huge deal for a very long time. The Chicago Cubs curse comes from 1945, when a man named Bill Sionis, nicknamed Billy Goat, he was kicked out of a Chicago Cubs game. Yeah, he actually didn't even get into game four to begin with. Was he too intoxicated? No. Did he bring a live goat with him to this game? Yes, that was why. Yeah, Bill brought with him his pet goat for good luck. So after the staff said, no, you can't enter the 1945 World Series with a live goat, he then cursed the club over and over on the way out. What a guy. Saying the Cubs ain't gonna win no more over and over again. And that was the game that they dropped the ball. So something kind of happened. The Detroit Tigers won and the curse of the Billy Goat kicked up off and it got so out of hand that come 1994, the Cubs had lost 12 games in a row, their worst home start in history. So Sam Sionis went to Wrigley Field, everybody was chanting to let the goat in and then the Cubs won 5-2. I don't know. Humans in the 1700s were like, oh, that woman's cursed. She's a witch for sure. And then humans today are like, ah, oh, that stadium's cursed. For sure cursed. We haven't changed. Moral of the story. I don't know. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Belcourt Castle Chairs. Belcourt Castle is located in Newport, Rhode Island and it is a former summer cottage. Construction on the cottage started in 1891 with it being completed in 1894 and inside there is a ballroom. This ballroom is important because it is said that it holds a group of haunted chairs. People who have visited the castle have reported a ton of strange happenings 
regarding this specific set of chairs. The report includes things like feeling chills racing up and down their spines or feeling a strange sensation in a shift of energy while standing near the chairs and some people have even explained how they have been pushed out of the chairs by an invisible force. I feel like just hearing these stories might be enough to explain the energy shift some people are feeling but actually being pushed out of a chair by some sort of invisible force would be absolutely terrifying. And simply unexplainable. What's going on there? In our number nine spot today, we have The Orphan Story. This is a book that was originally written in the early 1600s, but it didn't end up getting published until 2018. The Orphan Story is about a 14 year old Spanish boy who heads to the Americas. You know, a classic kind of coming of age feel good story. Right? Well, not exactly, and that is exactly the reason it took so long for this book to be published. While the curse in this book doesn't come from the story itself, there is something dark lurking in those pages. The book's publisher, Belinda Palacios, who worked on the book for two years, explained that throughout those years, she was often warned of the cursed book and how every publisher who had tried to work on it before ended up passing away in a mysterious way before they could finish the book. When Belinda looked into this, it turned out to be true. Her research showed that those who had tried to edit the book before her either found themselves in horrible accidents or with strange illnesses. Luckily, Belinda made it through the process unscathed, so let's hope that maybe the curse has been lifted? Either way, it's probably one I'll personally stay away from. In our number eight spot today, we have the Dybbuk box. This box, which was originally just a plain old wine box, is said to have been possessed by a Dybbuk, which in Jewish mythology is a malicious demon that takes over the bodies of living people and uses them for evil. The box began to gain attention in 2001 when it was being auctioned off on eBay. The seller explained that he had bought it at an estate sale of a woman who had survived the Holocaust. When he first opened the box, he found two 1920s pennies, a lock of blonde hair bound with a cord, a lock of black or brown hair bound with a cord, a small statue engraved with the Hebrew word shalom, a small golden wine goblet, one dried rosebud, and a single candle holder with four octopus shaped legs. Since he bought the box, he reported that strange things began happening such as really horrific nightmares for him and anyone who had stayed around or touched the box. And when he gave this box to his mother as a birthday gift, she suffered a stroke the same day. The box ended up in the hands of Zach Bagan, who is a paranormal investigator and it now resides in his haunted museum. The box also gained even more attention in 2018 when Post Malone touched it and has apparently been dealing with the repercussions of that ever since. In our number seven spot today, we have the Iceman. Okay, this one is not an object because it is rather a mummy who was once a real living person, but I still had to include him on this list because this story is wild. The mummy of Otzi, who is referred to as the Iceman, was found in 1991 in the Otzel Alps in Italy. It is believed that Otzi lived around 3000 BC and his body became mummified and preserved because of the glacier that surrounded him post-mortem. While this is an incredibly interesting discovery, the find finding of Otzi may have come in a package with an old curse just waiting to be released. Here's the thing, the people who helped with the discovery of Otzi are all dying under very mysterious circumstances. I mean, we are currently at person number seven within one year, so that's very suspicious. When molecular archaeologist Tom Loy was writing a book about Otzi, he passed away from a blood related condition that he was diagnosed with shortly after becoming involved with the Iceman. The German tourist Helmut Simon, who discovered the mummy, fell to his death while hiking in the same spot he saw Otzi. Dieter Warneck, who was the head of the mountain rescue team that was assigned to find the mummy, died of a heart attack at age 45, just an hour after Simon's funeral. To avoid this becoming an hour long list, I'll stop here, but that is just half of those who seemingly fell victim to the curse of the Iceman. I don't know, maybe disturbing a man who's been in the same spot for 53 centuries wasn't the best idea anyone's ever had. In our number five spot today, we have the ballista balls. A ballista was used in the Roman military and it was kind of similar to a crossbow, but was much larger and could shoot arrows or stones. In 1989, there was archeologists that were working by the Israeli-Syrian border when they found these large stones close to what seemed to be the remains of a ballista. But around 1995, the stones ended up getting stolen, but it took a while for anyone to notice. Fast forward to 2015 and the same stones 
stones that were stolen ended up in the courtyard of the museum in Israel with a note left from the person who stole them. The note explained that ever since they took them, he had experienced terrible luck and believed the stones were the reason. He had a very successful business that suddenly began to fail after he took the stones, and later his family abandoned him and he was forced to get rid of almost all of his possessions to settle all of his debts so as to not go bankrupt. He mentioned that he believed the stones were cursed and that they were the root of all of his problems. Whether or not these stones are actually cursed or this was just some pretty heavy karma, I hope this guy has been able to get his life back on track. In our number 4 spot today, we have James Dean's car. Okay. This might seem like a bit of a wild card, but hear me out. Famous actor James Dean passed away from a car accident on September 30th, 1955. He was driving his silver Porsche 550 Spider, which he had just purchased recently. This was only the beginning of the car's curse, however, as after James' passing, the remnants of the totaled car were bought by a man named George Barris. He decided to sell the parts of the car to James' fans, but when the car was being worked on and taken apart, it ended up falling on the mechanic and crushed him to death. These two incidents are more than enough to now consider this car cursed, but it still continues on. Once the people who had purchased some of the car parts began receiving them, more strange things happened. Three of the people who received parts ended up in car accidents, all of which were sadly quite severe. The shell of the car was also stolen, and to this day, it has never been recovered. In our number two spot today, we have Old Nick. Old Nick is often referred to as the Swansea Devil, and his story dates back to the 1890s, although he now resides in the Swansea Museum. So, back in the 1890s, there was the prestigious St. Mary's Church located right in the center of town. The church decided to do some renovations and they put out some ads to hire someone. When a local builder applied for the job and was turned down, he had a major overreaction and decided he wanted to get some kind of revenge. He went and bought the row of cottages that lay next to the church and then demolished them all. In their place, he built large brick offices and then he commissioned the carving of Old Nick and placed him right on top of the office building, looking down at St. Mary's Church. Legend goes that he even placed the curse himself by saying, when your church is destroyed and burnt to the ground, my devil will remain laughing. Some years later during World War II, a German blitz came through the town and it left most of the town, including St. Mary's, completely destroyed and burnt to the ground. But the office building with Old Nick was undamaged and remained standing. For a while, Old Nick seemed to kind of disappear, but once he resurfaced, there was a petition to put him back where he was before, as well as a subsequent counter petition to put him far, far away from the rebuilt St. Mary's Church. As of now, Old Nick resides behind glass in the Swansea Museum, and it is said that he is enclosed in glass, more for our protection than his. In our number one spot today, we have the Blarney Stone. For hundreds of years, the Blarney Stone has resided within Blarney Castle, which is near Cork, Ireland. The stone is a piece of limestone, and legend says that those who give the stone a smooch will then be given the gift of gab. This little smooch can bestow the power of being able to talk your way out of any situation, which would be incredibly useful, but there are always those who try to indulge in too much of a good thing. The issues start when you attempt to take a piece of the stone, no matter how small, away from its home. Those who don't follow the rules and take the stone end up being cursed with bad luck. Every year, the castle receives parcels from greedy tourists who tried their luck at stealing portions of the stone. These parcels are returned with the intention of lifting the curse of misfortune. It is said that once the stone is returned, the curse will be lifted, which is most definitely good news. I guess the moral of this curse, however, is to not be greedy and just follow the rules. Coming in at number 9, we have the occult museum voodoo dolls. Voodoo dolls in general are supernatural items, they're little effigies created in magical kind of practices, and for the person on the receiving end, they're bad juju. Pins are placed in the doll in order to harm the subject, which isn't great, not great at all. So with that in mind, a supernatural object used to invoke a curse, do you want to see the voodoo dolls from the Ed and Lorraine Warren Museum? Guys, you don't know how hard it is to say Ed and Lorraine Warren in one go. It's a tongue twister. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Little, little, little. By the way, voodoo dolls. Ah. So there is actually a noose on the neck of one of the dolls, which kind of indicates that somebody might have died. The other one has its eyes gouged out, which isn't great either. Visually scary, but also 
actually scary. It seems that the doll collector came across these dolls and bought them home, only to find that her son's health began deteriorating. It seems that some of the witch's voodoo doll magic had been retained and it was picked up the boy as a new vessel. The collector contacted the Warrens who removed the doll, after which the boy made a full recovery, thank goodness. However, it seems that the story continues. There was a visitor to the museum and they broke the rules by touching one of the dolls and later they were involved in a horrifying accident. Who's to blame here? Coming in at number 7 we have the evil eye. Ah, the curse of the evil eye. Although actually this is an interesting twist at this point because these objects actually protect against curses. The evil eye is a curse cast by a malevolent and malicious glare given to a person when they aren't looking. If an evil eye is cast upon you, you are susceptible to injury or misfortune. It could even mean that you're set upon by animals. To protect yourself from the evil eye, usually people carry a talisman with an eye on it, which in themselves look pretty terrifying, but actually they're there to stare down a curse. The evil eye has been incorporated into a lot of protective objects, most popularly jewellery. Also there are a lot of evil eye wall hangings and wind chimes. I feel like I'd quite like an evil eye bracelet so it can stare down a few evil eyes that have been looking my way recently, like bah! Reflected curse. Coming in at number six, we have cursed tarot cards. Tarot cards are used in divination for forecasting rather than predicting. Usually, a person formulates a question and seeks an answer from the cards, a deck of 78 individual cards with different meanings. The most famous cards are death, the tower, and the devil, all thought to be bad omens, but of course, that depends on your interpretation. Some people are convinced that their tarot decks can become cursed and that everything that's forecast will actually happen. Badly. There is also a superstition that burning tarot cards will bring a curse upon you. It seems that the only way to be rid of a cursed deck of tarots is to drown them, soak them all face down in water. Honestly, I'm not so sure about that. I think they work by energy, so if you have bad energy, maybe you'll get bad cards. Coming in at number five, we have Maori masks. Maori is the name of the indigenous people of New Zealand and Polynesia. Masks are made to honour their ancestors, and they're often beautifully carved and slightly intimidating to look at. The masks are thought to contain the souls of warriors who died in battle, so pretty supernatural and ghostly if you ask me. While men are fine to be going around touching a Maori mask, Females have a much more uncertain time. Legend has it you should never seek out a Maori mask if you're pregnant or menstruating because you could invoke an ancient curse. In October 2010, a museum in New Zealand made headlines when it told a pregnant woman to stay away from the sacred artifacts. Speaking of sacred, at number four we have Uluru. Is a rock formation an object? Either way, I'm putting it on this list. Uluru or Ayers Rock is both sacred and cursed, if the stories are to be believed. The large sandstone monolith in the Northern Territory of Central Australia is sacred to Aboriginal tribes, the first people of the land. They believe that it is inhabited by the ancestral spirits of the land. The rock started forming 550 million years ago and it's believed that if a visitor takes a rock from the spot, they will suffer serious misfortune, sometimes even grave misfortune. There have been reports of people returning stones that they've taken from Ayers Rock to try and end their suffering. Shouldn't be taking the rocks in the first place. Coming in at number 3 we have the Terracotta Army. I kind of believe that the Terracotta Army have an air of the supernatural about them. They were after all a work of funeral art that were buried with the purpose of protecting an emperor in the afterlife. The thousands of Terracotta figures were buried with the first emperor of China in 210 BCE, but they were rediscovered by local farmers thousands of years later in 1974 in Yang village's rural land. For them though, the discovery was actually a curse. The government didn't pay them well for their findings and then they took their land and their homes off them in order to build a tourist centre. The government made a lot of money, they didn't. One of the farmers who discovered the soldiers actually killed himself and the others were met with bad luck, many of whom have died penniless. Coming into number two, whatever you do, do not touch the demon book. The Book of Soiga is an early 16th century treatise on demonology written in Latin. There are only two copies of the book in the world known to us, and one was possessed by the Elizabethan scholar John Dee. Dee spent his life trying to interpret the text, which was filled with spells and rituals. He had a good understanding of what was happening, apart from the final 36 pages, which he just 
couldn't decipher. He and his trusted friend Edward Kelly summoned the spirit of Oriel to tell them the meaning of the last pages. The legend says that Oriel then possessed Kelly and spoke through him. He claimed that the book came into existence when Adam entered paradise and that it could only be properly interpreted by the archangel Michael himself. He also said that whoever deciphers the meaning of the last 36 pages will be destined to die two and a half years later. Why two and a half? We don't know, but I wouldn't want to be reading that book. Finally, climbing into number one, we have the Delhi Purple Sapphire. Also known as the Gem of Sorrow, the Delhi Purple Sapphire was housed in a sacred temple in India, the temple of Indra in Kampur. Indra, by the way, is the Hindu god of war and thunderstorms. Amid the British led turmoil in India, it wasn't uncommon for soldiers to loot sacred temples, stealing their jewels and smuggling them back to Britain. This is exactly what happened with the purple sapphire in question. Colonel W. Ferris took it back to England only to be met with terrible, terrible luck. Financial misfortunes befell him, his family got very sick, things started to fall apart. He gave the stone away, and the person who who received it committed the next owner of the sapphire was Edward Heron Allen, who was also met with really bad luck. He bound the stone with silver and attached two scarab beetles, and it seemed like the bad luck was contained. However, his dreams were frequently haunted by Hindu yogis until he gave the stone away. The stone then was returned to him, so he threw it in Regent's Canal in London. No prizes for guessing that actually it came back. The story continues over another hundred or so years. More recently, it found its way to a museum, and one night, the museum curator was travelling with the stone only to be injured by a terrible storm with his wife. Mm -hmm.